The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, an out of this world Christmas and discounts on Lois McMaster Bujold ebooks. Plus, we continue our ongoing audiobook serialization of Timothy Zahn's Cobra, all right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour. It's a pleasure to have you along. I am Bain Associate Editor and your podcast host, David Afsharirad. On this Christmas Eve Eve, we are bringing you a gift in the form of Griffin Barber's interview with Will McCarthy about McCarthy's latest entry in the Rich Man's Sky series, Poor Man's Sky. The novel is the second book in a planned four-book series and will delight fans of the earlier entry. But if you're not all caught up in your reading, never fear. Poor Man's Sky also works as a standalone science fiction mystery thriller centered on a murder on the moon. Barbara and McCarthy's discussion is coming up in just a moment, but first, the news. If you find yourself with a quiet moment during all the holiday madness, don't scroll through your social media. Head on over to Bain.com and read this month's free short story, Xmas at ESL1. The story is by today's podcast guest, Will McCarthy, and is set in his Rich Man's Sky universe. Let's take a look. Christmas comes but once a year, or so they say. But for those living at ESL-1, the space station owned by trillionaire Igbal Rins, Christmas likely won't come at all. It's hard to arrange an old-fashioned holiday when you're 1.5 million kilometers sunward of Earth. But Igbal Rins didn't become one of the four richest men on Earth by taking the easy path. And this Christmas, he may just have something up his sleeve. Once again, that's Xmas at ESL1 by Will McCarthy, free to read now at Bain.com. Looking for the perfect gift this holiday season? Well, look no further. Give the Bain books lovers in your life what they really want, more Bain books with Bain Books gift cards. You decide the amount, but remember, eARCs are $15 a piece, monthly bundles, $18. Pretty sure they already have everything? Head on over to the Bain Cafe Press Store and check out our wide variety of Bain merchandise with travel mugs, t-shirts, tote bags, hats, and more. There is something for every Bain fan. And don't forget about the Bain Challenge coins. All of this information can be found at Bain.com and act now while supplies last. Hi there, I'm Griffin Barber, your host for today's edition of the Bain Free Radio Hour. Will McCarthy, author of Poor Man's Sky, has a rich history, not only as a novelist, but also as an engineer, entrepreneur, and journalist. As an engineer, he served as a flight controller for Lockheed Martin Space Launch Systems. As an entrepreneur and engineer, Will has been engineering manager for Omnitech Robotics and later founded Raven Brick LLC. He holds technology patents in a number of countries. And Will's been a columnist and contributor for TV and Wired Magazine, as well as writing many nonfiction articles on science and engineering topics. In between and during all this, Mr. McCarthy has managed to write a lot of short fiction for a who's who of fan venues receiving nominations for his work for many of the best-known awards organizations. Poor Man's Sky, the hard SF novel we are here to talk about today, is his seventh novel and the sequel to the amazing Rich Man's Sky. Hello and welcome, Will. Hi. Uh, I don't. I actually don't think it's my seventh novel. I think it's maybe my twelfth. Uh, it's so, uh, yeah, I've kind of lost count. Okay. Well, good deal. I, sorry about that error there. Um, so hardest question first, uh, what is the coolest aspect of poor man's sky for you? Uh, yeah, that is a hard question. Um, the, uh, uh, what I, what I'm trying to do in, in this series, uh, is, uh, tell a future that's as complicated as the present. Uh, and the only way to do that is to tell it through multiple different points of view. Um, but, um, uh, that that's the most important thing about it is that uh, I'm not I mean, I'm trying to tell a story. I'm trying to tell an interesting story, but I'm also trying to tell a whole world through the lens of that story. Um, 
and uh, yeah, it's it, it's quite a challenge. So, uh, did you then stumble on that aspect, or that that wanting to challenge yourself with that, or did you work your way toward to it, or did the characters kind of dictate it, or uh, sounds like a little bit like the latter, or at least the world required it. The world required it. Yeah, I mean, I started with the idea of the uh, the sunshade at Earth Sun Lagrange Point One, um, uh, and things just kind of mushroomed out from there. And I realized that to get even to that one thing that the sunshade at ESO One, just that by itself required an incredibly intricate world um, to have the infrastructure infrastructure to to support that. And so, if I want to tell us not a small you know, fake story, but a but a rich, realistic story. That meant that I had to really talk about how the world allows a thing like that to 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 occur. And then also to to make sure that you didn't overtell it or try and oversell it, which is something I was major uh, majorly impressed with was how you managed to toe that line. You know, you don't oversell the talking about the technology as opposed to the story, the throughput for the for your readers. Uh, it's quite impressive. Um, that's that's a skill I've worked on for decades. Um, uh, a hard science fiction novel requires you to dispense a lot of information to the reader, um, and you know, in the beginning when you're starting out, you just want to give these giant blocks of information to the reader and then say, okay, well now we can tell the story. But it doesn't work that way. Readers don't like that, so you have to find a way to drop the information along the the path of the story so that. Every time something happens, you already know what you need to know for that to make sense. Um, yeah. So a poor man's sky has at his heart a police officer with a history of changing careers in pursuit of a dream, or at least of a better life. Uh, in his current profession, Ramey Vaught is a homicide detective in Colorado Springs with dreams of becoming an administrator on the first colony on Mars. Did you uh, model Ramey Vaught on anyone in particular, fictitious or real? Uh, you know, a long, long time ago, I um, uh, wrote a novel called Murder in the Solid State. And as part of the research for that, I um, uh, interviewed a couple of times uh, an actual homicide detective in the uh, uh, Denver area. And I just, it, it left a big impression on me, um, you know, not just his personality, but his view of his job and uh, you know, the evidentiary process and, and things like that. So that played uh, a, a large part in it. I also know a lot of lawyers. Um, and I kind of like the idea of somebody transitioning from lawyer to cop. Uh, just because you always hear lawyers saying, if only the cops would do it right. And I just thought, well, how about if someone actually said, I'm going to be a cop and do it right. Uh, and that way, you know, these, these, miscarriages of justice won't occur. Um, yeah, one of the uh, interesting sideline, I'm a, a retired police officer. One of the guys in the class, I think uh, behind me, uh, was uh, going to law school at the same time as he was becoming a police officer and finished his law degree and became a licensed attorney uh, and then rep, rep the department uh, and uh, has since climbed the ranks in the, in the department as well. But yeah, it's a fascinating uh, um, kind of juxtaposition because one of the things that you see within uh, the law enforcement community is the same kind of aspect or attitude towards the attorneys. Is well, why aren't you doing this the right way or that kind of you know, not handling it correctly? Sure, sure. I mean, everybody wants to kind of you know, <laughs> right point the right. fingers one way or another. Um, and you know, the other thing you mentioned that Ramey's uh, changed careers a lot, and that's that's me. I mean, I, I've, I've been all over the map. Um, and so it's actually hard for me in a way to relate to people who've done one thing for their whole career. Uh, I think that's increasingly rare uh, for one thing, but it, it's also, uh, you know, that, that kind of meandering through, through different stuff. Uh, I think that that's more interesting. Definitely. Well, it also gives you the experience to be able to write about a, different, a lot of different things, having experienced uh, things from different angles. Uh, I quite enjoyed uh, Poor Man's Sky depiction of policing and the incredibly difficult circumstances those policing a non-military settlement in space will have on their hands. Uh, what kind of research did you end up doing in this arena? Well, I mean, uh, the, the murder takes place at a monastery. Um, 
and so I had to uh, learn a lot about about uh, monastery life. Um, and you know that that in a way the the monastery is one of the main characters of the story. It's such a um, it's a small environment, but it's rich in its own way, um, and it it has uh, it in, imposes a lot of constraints on the investigation, uh, just because the crime scene is utterly contaminated, and every suspect is also necessary for the operation of the facility. Um, so uh, it's it's kind of a locked room mystery where someone in there knows something that they're not telling. Um, but uh, you can't just say everybody stop. You know, quit doing what you're doing. Don't don't clean up the the crime scene. They have to clean up the crime scene because moon dust is toxic. Uh, so yeah, those 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 uh, those challenges uh, bring a lot of energy to the story. I think. Well, it's a locked airlock mystery. Right? <laughs> yes. So as opposed to a locked room or airlock mystery. There we go. Have a whole new subgenre, sub subgenre. Um, so, did you do much research on like the the treaties that govern uh, uh, what goes on in space at this point, or did you kind I, of I know did, a lot yeah. of that already? The the problem that we have right now is that um, the treaties that govern space constrain only governments. Um, you know, at the time these treaties treaties were written, it was kind of unthinkable that any sort of non governmental entity would be able to reach its fingers into space. Um, but now we're, we're rethinking that. Um, so the problem is that as people start to build things in space, there really is no legal infrastructure for who owns it, you know, uh, who's in charge, what, what laws apply. Uh, and so this is, this is a real problem when somebody gets murdered, who has jurisdiction, who, what, who, where are the courts, who are the police, uh, I, I read so, somewhere. I read somewhere about the International Space Station. The way they basically worked it out was Reagan said, "No, we're going to handle all, all investigations there." <laughs> and then it was, it was so. What kind of investigations are you going to handle, and what kind of crime is going to be? You know, what how the what statute will apply was based on the the builder of the module and the nationality of the victim. Uh huh. Which you know is. It's it's very tangled. I would love to talk to an attorney about how that would work out. <laughs> yeah, and the only other the the best parallel that we have is maritime law. Right. You know, for a for a ship at sea, the ship has a captain, and the captain has a lot of broad authority. But the captain doesn't own the ship. Um, you know, and it, it's so it's, it's complicated. I, oh yeah, and that's one of the, that's part of the fun of this as well is that your your officer Ramy is is very aware that he's got like limited to no power like he doesn't he knows where his uh the extent of his power you know stops and how much out on a limb he is uh and during it which for any officer is a very uncomfortable place to be because you, you want to know what you can and can't do so sure. uh, which character in in poor man's sky surprised you uh you know i think they all did um uh you, but I, I suppose I would have to say the the, the monks in the monastery. Um, initially, I had just thought of, of the you know the monastery is is featured lightly in in Rich Man's Sky, and I wanted to tell a little bit more about about that part of the world. Um, but the more I dug into it, the more it just took on a life of its own, uh, and the and the monks all have their their very distinct personalities. Um, and that just that's one of the real pleasures of writing is the way the the characters kind of take on their own voice and and do what what they want to do um so the older i get the the less i adhere to my outlines okay and so uh how did that particular class of characters uh, come to be then the, the the monastery or the the monks uh, well, there's a monastery in Snowmass, Colorado, that um, my my wife has spent quite a lot of time in. Uh, Benedictine monasteries often run guest houses um, where you can go there for a retreat. Um, and if you want, they can teach you how to meditate or teach you how to pray, or or they can just leave you alone and you can enjoy the, the solitude. Um, and so um, I, I've only been there once, uh, and it's kind of it's in disarray, at least at the moment. Um, 
uh, a lot of monastic institutions are having a hard time maintaining themselves in the 21st century because it's very, very difficult to recruit people. It's very difficult to say to people, staying here in this place for the rest of your life is your best option out of all the possible options. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, I, I uh, uh, went there once. My wife's been there a lot, and we have a friend who, who was a, is a, a former monk there. And um, so I just, that was kind of the jumping off point, um, uh, just my, my first impression. But then, you know, St. Joseph of Cupertino Monastery in the South Polar Mineral Territories on the Moon, it became its own place. It, it doesn't really bear any any uh, uh, resemblance to the to the monastery that that uh, germinated the idea. Right. So, uh, in a similar vein, uh, which character from Poor Man's Sky would you want to avoid, like the plague, and maybe why? Uh, well, one of the things that's uh, interesting about this series. Uh, if I tell the story through multiple different points of view, I want to tell each point of view honestly. So when you're in the head of a particular character, that character is pretty sure that what they're doing is fine. Um, but from the point of view of other characters or perhaps of the reader, what that character is doing is not fine. Um, Everybody's so, the hero of their own story, right? Right, right. Uh, and I don't want to take too strong a position on who I think is right or wrong. I think I want to let the, the the story and the characters speak for themselves. But the the person I would least want to have interactions with would be Grigory Orlov. Uh, he's a trillionaire, and he he comes from the uh, uh, Russian energy company uh, style of of oligarchy, uh, where it involves a lot of people being pushed out of windows and. Uh, uh, stuff like that. So he's the one who uh, uh, is least likely to color inside the lines of, uh, of polite society. Uh, and this is a problem for everybody because when there's a labor dispute in his facility, um, uh, he's not inclined to handle it politely, uh, but neither are the people who work for him. Right. Uh, and so that creates a, uh, a very tense situation when everybody's got this kind of mafia mindset, but you're all in a uh, enclosure together inside uh, the, the vacuum of space. Uh, you kind of have to come to the negotiating table, even if you don't want to. Right. And so which character would you want as an ally? Then? Oh, Brother Michael, the, uh, the, the prior of the monastery. Um, he's, a, he's a very uh, quiet, but, but can do kind of guy. Very bossy, competent. bossy, but competent. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they also seem to, one of the things I enjoyed about the brothers is that they had a sense of humor. Uh, and, and that was one of the things that kind of was like, that's, that's pretty cool. Cause I, I would imagine that being in those tight confines, you need one. <laughs> you know, I think you put any, any group of people together um, and they're either, they're either going to find their, their sense of humor or they're going to fall apart. Um, and that's no less true, you know, just because someone's a monk doesn't mean they're not like a regular guy who, uh, you know, likes all the stuff that other people like. So are any of the above characters uh, based on real people? Not really, no. Um, the the characters are all, they all arise out of circumstance. You know, I, I, I thought of the world first, um, and then I thought of the infrastructure that would make that world possible. And then I thought of the people that would make that infrastructure possible. Um, and then, you know, like I say, I I want to tell each each character uh, as honestly as I can. And, you know, there just isn't anybody like that in our world. Uh, so, no, they, they, they can't be too, too closely based on real people. Right. So most authors find it harder to write near future stories than far future ones. Uh, is this the case for you? Oh, definitely, yes. Um, one of the problems is that if you're if you're too close to the technology, if you're writing about like technological innovations uh, in the near future, uh, scientific advancement is going to catch up with you. Things that you think are thirty years away are actually going to happen tomorrow, or they've already happened, and you just didn't read about it. Um, 
So a lot of that is is uh, is very challenging. Fortunately, this is more a story about infrastructure than it is about specific enabling technologies. So there I'm a little bit safer because I know if someone's not going to build a moon base tomorrow without my hearing about it. Uh, but but yeah, it, it is very challenging, um, especially you know, if you if you if you're trying to tell it honestly, if you're trying to tell, uh, it's easy to tell a narrow story about one person doing one thing. If you're trying to tell a large story about how the world is evolving, um, then yeah, it's it's very challenging because the closer it is to now, the harder it is to convince people that you're not full of shit. <laughs> Absolutely, and and or will be proven wrong in the next few months or years. Right, right. Another aspect of it, I would imagine. <laughs> so uh, I I alluded to this earlier, but having studied a little bit of the legal situation on the moon and in space, I was fascinated by the lack of codified legal structure for how occupying the moon or any non-terrestrial body will work, let alone how or who gets to pursue criminals and enforce laws most people agree on, like homicide. Uh, I particularly like the way agreements had to be reached between several powers for Ramey to go up and investigate, let alone make an arrest. Uh, do you think it will remain that way when we start building permanent halves, or will we have to hammer out more agreements first? I think hammering out the agreements is hard. I think it was very easy when the Outer Space Treaty was signed. It was fine because we weren't really doing it. No one was really in a position to to try to extract minerals from the moon uh, or, or anything like that. Um, so yeah, I think that that uh, we're likely to get um, companies doing it or countries doing it um, outside of the existing legal framework, um, and that's actually part of the part of the engine that drives the the, the story here. Um, in Rich Man's Sky, it was a lot about um, how power was concentrated too much power was concentrated in too few hands. And that's good in terms of getting things done quickly. It's not necessarily uh, like our American ideal of, uh, you know, distributed power. Um, so, uh, but because all this is happening outside the reach of earthly law, there's not a lot to be done about it in rich man's sky, in poor man's sky, uh, it's more about people who aren't trillionaires finding that they have some power to determine outcomes as well. Uh, they don't necessarily have to accept at face value things that, that are handed to them, um, things that are perhaps not fair or not safe or, or what have you. So uh, a poor man's sky has not only believable technology, but we are given reasonable reasons to have that tech explained to us as Ramey Vaught is competing for a place on the first ship heading to Mars. But that position isn't among the science uh, uh, personnel or engineers, but as an admin. So you get away with uh, explaining some stuff that you wouldn't otherwise probably be able to. Uh, I found the explanations clear and they imparted an understanding of some very difficult concepts. Uh, where did this skill explaining science and technology come from? Well, I'd like to think I've always had it, but the truth is that um, uh, I was a science journalist for many, many years. Uh, and uh, especially a lot of the time there, you have a difficult concept that you need to explain to the reader and you have like 800 pages or 800 words to do it. So here, uh, the, the, there's a new type of radar communication. Um, uh, it's revolutionary in a lot of ways. You have 800 words, go, um, and also make it fun, make the reader care so they don't just flip to the next article. Um, so that kind of thing um, really sharpens up your your ability to, uh, uh, if you're going to stay in that, in that realm for any amount of time, you have to get good at explaining it fast and in a way that's fun. So have you ever thought about uh, adding a teaching credential to your resume? Oh, I have taught, uh, you know, at, at, at various times. Um, it's not, uh, it's not my ideal uh, uh, choice right now. Okay. So, uh, getting back to the story in particular, there are vast inequities in wealth and power in poor man's sky, even among the astronauts serving at the various facilities. 
Uh, I've been up close and personal with some labor disputes in the past, and the one driving the opening scenes is quite a doozy. Uh, the way that an individual horseman and his people negotiate their differences seemed well-researched to me. Was there a particular incident you were thinking of when you wrote it? Not a particular incident, no. Just kind of, if you look at the history of labor disputes in in England and in the United States, um, you know, they, they have a certain uh, way that they go, but then you add the factor that, you know, you're, you're all trapped at a facility together and, you know, maybe uh, uh, the, the administration might control certain aspects of the station from their control center, but the people who actually work in the station can shut off the air right. or, or uh, you know, shut off the hydraulics that, that open the doors. So you have this uh, kind of uneasy balance of power that that really kind of accentuates the uh, the grudges that that drive labor disputes uh, in the first place. So the the four horsemen, uh, the trillionaires carving out places for humanity in space, seem bent on changing changing the fate of humanity, whether their governments want it to or not. Um, do you see private business or at least extra governmental organizations? like the church as the main route to the future of humanity in space? I don't know about the main route. I mean, my my easy answer is yes, uh, because private industry is doing a better job of creating the infrastructure that we need than, than the government ever did. But at the same time, a lot of the money is still coming from the government. Um, you know, Elon Musk, whether you love him or hate him, he has caught, cut the price of, of uh, launching things into space by a factor of five. Um, and that didn't happen by accident. That happened very much by intention and design. And yet his main customer is the government. Um, so he wouldn't have been able to make all those tremendous uh, uh, infrastructure investments if he didn't have a customer buying the stuff. And now SpaceX is uh, building a lunar lander. But again, the, the customer for that lunar lander is, is the government. Right. So it may be that, you know, the public the, private partnerships. At least at least the first mission to the moon will be a public private partnership. Um, then once you have the, uh, uh, the the tooling in place to send people to the moon again, uh, it may be that that SpaceX will uh, fund its own missions to the moon for its own purposes. But it's still you can't take government out of the equation entirely, at least not right now. And I think even even 30, 40 years from now, governments are still going to have a hand in, not necessarily in a way that that the uh, private industry would like. Well, isn't it, it's kind of a weird thing. Is, isn't SpaceX uh, renting launch facilities too, or, or using uh, government launch facilities? I can't remember. In some... Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the uh, Kennedy Space Center and, and Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, the, that's government property. Um, but that's not really a whole lot different from launching from a from an airport that's that's owned by a government. Um, uh, you know, that that's not special. But at the same time, um, uh, SpaceX has facilities down in Brownsville where, uh, you know, the intention is to do a lot of launching. Uh, over the over the Gulf uh, from their own private facility. Right. So uh, a, par a poor man's guy has uh, many characters spending a lot of time and effort to maintain a social media profile so they can obtain funding for their hopes and dreams. Uh, was this based on watching the current generation discover ways to make money and influence culture online or something else? I mean, it just seemed like... Uh, if we were going to send 100 people to Mars, it seemed like, uh, of course, that would be a reality show. Everything's a reality show these days. I don't like it. It's not like that's not my preferred way to send people to Mars. It's just that why would you spend your own money when you can have, uh, you know, people funneling donations to their favorite uh, uh, competitor? Um, so it just it seemed logical that that that's how it would it would unfold um, well, and it's it's interesting in this day and age of crowdfunding kind of thing too is, is that it's almost like that but it's also the reality tv show and minus most of the alcohol apparently <laughs> yeah uh, you know and 
I think like like most people these days, I have I have you know sort of a an uneasy love hate relationship with social media. I'm not going to say that that I uh, you know want it to be that way, but at the same time, uh, there are things you can accomplish with social media that really weren't individual people have more reach now than they did 10 or 20 years ago. Um, and I think that that kind of empowerment is going to proceed into the future. So on a personal note, I hope you're all re already hard at work on a third book in the series. Uh, any chance of a date such a book might land on shelves? You know, I'm still working on it. Um, uh, until I have a first draft complete, I don't uh, think it's wise to comment on uh, on when the the publication date might be, um, but the, the the good news is that um, each of these books are intended to stand on their own. So if you read Poor Man's Sky, you're not going to be left hanging until the next book comes out. And similarly, if you if you haven't read Rich Man's Sky, you can pick up Poor Man's Sky and just read it as its own story. So uh, it's a series, but it's a loose series. Um, well, it, um, one of the I used, I wrote with Eric Flint. One of the things he always talked about was is that make make each book of complete tale, and you've done right. that with the Poor Man's Sky. I hadn't read Rich Man's Sky before I read this, and I was uh, taken along for the ride uh, without having to be concerned about what happened before. Because again, self-contained tale. It all uh, it was very engaging, and really, really enjoyed it. Um, so I'm sorry to hear that you're have, still working on the draft, but I'm content to, to hear that you are working on a draft for the next one in the series. Um, so what aside from its considerable raw entertainment value do you hope readers will carry with them long after reading Poor Man's Sky? Um, I mean, raw entertainment value is the primary thing that I hope people get out of it. Uh, you know, we read science fiction uh, we read it for the ideas and we read it for the characters, but mostly we read it to be entertained. Um, so I hope that people enjoy the book and I hope that they that they tell their friends that they enjoyed the book. Um, but in terms of message, um, I think part of my intent in kind of showing the world through many different sets of eyes is that the future is a real place. Um, and it's just as complicated and just as dangerous and just as confusing as the present. And we're all going to be there, or hopefully we're all going to be there. Um, uh, and, you know, it just, it doesn't pay to trivialize the future. It doesn't pay to uh, uh, think of the future in in shallow terms. Uh, uh, it's, you know, it, it's, it's going to be complicated. Good deal. So last questions, uh, what quest, what conventions can your fans hope to catch up with you at and what other work do you have in the pipeline for your fans to read? Well, let's see. Um, I'm uh, really focusing on on the third book in the series right now, Beggar's Sky. Um, I have a, 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 a Christmas themed uh, short story up on the Bain website right now called Xmas at ESL1, which is set in the uh, Rich Man's Sky series, um, actually in between the events of Rich Man's Sky and Poor Man's Sky. I have a novella coming out in analog, but I don't have a, um, a publication date for that yet. It's called The Jangler. Um, but uh, really, mostly I'm nose to the grindstone. Um, Beggar's Sky is a, is a very difficult uh, uh, book in a lot of ways. Um, I'm trying to work in some themes that are kind of well-worn in science fiction, but I'm trying to do it in a new way. And that's either a really great idea or a really terrible one. Right. <laughs> so uh, uh, a lot of work goes into making sure that it's the former and, and not the latter. Um, um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm just, uh, just trying, to, trying to get it done. <laughs> And as far as conventions? Oh, right. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. I'm going um, uh, in January. I'll be at Cosine in Colorado Springs. Um, and then I'll be at Liberty Con and I will be at Mile High Con. Um, those are the ones that are nailed down right now. Um, but I, I'll, I'm going to I'm going to hit a few more along the way. So uh, if you can't. If you can't find me at one of those three, 
um, just uh, you know watch this space. I'll I'll figure out a couple more that I'm able to hit. I might go to the um, uh, National Space Society conference in Washington D.C. I went there last year and had a great time. Um, but you know I'm also I'm reachable online. Uh, I'm on Facebook. I know that's the uncool place to be, but uh, it's easy and I like it. Yep. I mean, I'm there too. I don't know that I like it, but I'm there too. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Will. This has been uh, Will McCarthy speaking about uh, Horror Man's Sky with Griffin Barber. I uh, hope you enjoyed it and I hope to see you again soon, Will, with the next book and next installment in the uh, Rich Man's Sky series. Thank you very much. Good to be here. And now we bring you Timothy Zahn's Cobra. Earth's only hope was the Cobras. The colony world's Adirondack and Silvern fell to the troughed forces almost without a struggle. Outnumbered and on the defensive, Earth made a desperate decision. It would attack the aliens not from space, but on the ground, with forces the troughs did not even suspect. Thus were created the Cobras, a guerrilla force whose weapons were surgically implanted, invisible to the unsuspecting eye, yet undeniably deadly. But power brings temptation, and not all the Cobras could be trusted to fight for Earth alone. Johnny Moreau would learn the uses and abuses of his special abilities and what it truly meant to be a Cobra. Loyalist 2414. The boundary between field and forest was as sharp as a laser beam. The giant blue-green cyprines running right up to the half meter of orange veggie barrier insulating the tender wheat shoots from native plant encroachment. In his more philosophical moments, Johnny saw a multi-leveled yin-yang in the arrangement. Tall versus short, old versus young, native versus man-made. At the moment, though, his mood was anything but philosophical. Looking up from the note, he found the youth who had delivered it standing in a rigid imitation of military attention. And what exactly is this supposed to mean? he asked, waving the notepaper gently. The message is self-explanatory, sir, the boy began. Yes, I can read, Johnny interrupted him. And one more sir out of you, Elmo, and I'm going to tell your father on you. What I meant was, why did Chalinor send you all the way out here just to invite me to a meeting? That's what these things are supposed to be for. He tapped the compact phone resting on his hip. C2 Chalinor didn't want to take any chances on word leaking out about this, sir. Uh, Johnny, Almo corrected himself hastily. It's a private meeting, for Cobras only. Johnny studied the other's face a moment, then folded the paper and stuck it in his pocket. Whatever Chalinor was trying to prove, browbeating his messenger boy wouldn't do any good. You can give Chalinor a definite maybe, he told Almo. There's a spine leopard that's been poking around the edge of the forest lately. If I don't get it today, I'll have to ride guard with Chin's planter tonight. C2 Chalinor said I should emphasize the meeting was very important. So's my word. And I promised Chin he could start his second seedling run by tonight. Johnny reached for his phone. If you'd like, I can call Chalinor and tell him that myself, he suggested. No, that's all right, Almo said hastily. I'll tell him. Thank you for your time. With that, he took off across the field toward where his car was waiting. Johnny felt a smile touch his lips, but his amusement quickly faded. There weren't a lot of teenagers in this part of Aventine. The first two waves of colonists had all been childless, and two succeeding waves of families hadn't made up the deficit, and Johnny had always felt a twinge of pain for the enhanced loneliness he knew Almo and his peers must feel. The four cobras assigned to Almo's town of Thanksgiving were obvious role models for the teenage boys, at least, and Johnny was glad Almo had found a friend in Torres Chalinor. At least he used to be glad. Now he wasn't entirely sure. Almo's car took off with minimal dust, and Johnny turned both his face and attention to the towering trees. He'd worry about Chalinor's cloak and laser later. Right now he had a spine leopard to kill. Making sure all the equipment on his belt was secured, he crossed the veggie barrier and entered the forest. Even after seven years on Aventine, 
Johnny felt a sense of awe whenever he stepped under the ancient canopy of oddly shaped leaves that turned the day into a diffuse twilight. Partly it was the forest's age, he had long ago decided, but partly also it was the humbling reminder of how little mankind knew about the world it had so recently claimed as its own. The forest was teeming with plant and animal life, virtually none of which was really understood. Clicking on his vision and auditory enhancers, Johnny moved deeper into the woods, trying to watch all directions at once. The extra loud snap of a branch above and behind him was his only warning, but it was enough. His nanocomputer correctly interpreted the sound as being caused by a large airborne body, and almost before Johnny's brain had registered the sound, his servos had taken over, throwing him to the side just as four sets of claws slashed through the space he'd vacated. Johnny rolled through a somersault, barely missing a glue-vine-covered tree, and came up into a crouch. He got a glimpse of the spine leopard as it leaped toward him, razor-edged quills tucked tightly against its forelegs, and again his computer took over. Standing flat-footed in the open, the only weapons Johnny could bring to bear were his fingertip lasers, but even as it again threw him to the side, his computer used them with deadly efficiency. The twin needles of light lanced out, sweeping across the alien creature's head. The spine leopard screamed, a full-bodied ululation that seemed to bounce off the inside of Johnny's stomach, and its spines snapped reflexively upright on its legs. The instinctive defensive move proved useless. Johnny was already beyond reach of the spine tips. Again he hit the ground, but this time he didn't roll back to his feet. Looking back over his shoulder, he saw the spine leopard struggling to get up, apparently oblivious to the black lines crisscrossing its face and to the brain damage behind them. A wound like that would have killed a human outright, but the less centralized alien metabolism wasn't as susceptible to localized destruction. The creature rose to its feet, spines still fully spread, and the brilliant flash of his anti-armor laser caught the spine leopard in the head, and this time the destruction was more than adequate. Carefully, Johnny got to his feet, wincing at the fresh bruises the battle had given him. His ankle felt warmer than it should have after only a single shot from the anti-armor laser. A heat sensitization, he'd long suspected, due largely to his overuse of the weapon during the Tyler Mansion escape. Even on Aventine, it seemed, he couldn't entirely escape the after-effects of the war. Taking one last look around him, he pulled out his phone and punched for the operator. Ariel, the computer's voice said. Chin Reston, Johnny told it. A moment later, the farmer's voice came on. Reston here. Johnny Moro, Chin. I got your spine leopard. I hope you didn't want it stuffed. I had to burn its head off. Hell with the head. Are you okay? Johnny smiled. You worry too much, you know that? I'm fine. It never laid a spine on me. If you want, I'll put a beacon on it, and you can come get the pelt whenever you want. Sounds good. Thanks a lot, Johnny. I really appreciate it. No charge. Talk to you later. Pressing the off switch, Johnny again punched for the operator. Kenneth MacDonald, he told the computer. There was a moment of silence. No answer, the operator informed him. Johnny frowned. Like all Cobras on Aventine, MacDonald was supposed to carry his phone with him at all times. He was probably out in the forest or somewhere equally dangerous and didn't want to be distracted. Record a message. Recording. Ken, this is Johnny Moreau. Call me as soon as you get a chance, preferably before this evening. Switching off, Johnny returned the phone to his belt and unfastened one of the two tiny transponders from the underside of his emergency pouch. A flick of a switch set it in operate mode. Stepping over the dead spine leopard, he dropped the device on its flank. For a moment, he looked down at the creature, his eyes drawn to the foreleg spines. Aventine's biologists were unanimous in the opinion that the spine's placement and range of angles made them defensive rather than offensive weapons. The only problem was that no one had ever found any creature on the planet that a spine leopard might need such weapons to outfight. Personally, Johnny had no desire to be around when the first of that unknown species was discovered. Reactivating his sensory enhancers, he began working his way back out of the forest. That was another installment in Timothy Zahn's Cobra, and that's it for the podcast. Thanks, as always, to Audible.com and podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. Praise, thanks, and gratitude to Will McCarthy for taking time out of his busy schedule to sit down with us today. 
and good night, Tony Daniel, wherever you are. This is David F. Shirod coming to you from a soundproof bunker somewhere deep in the heart of Texas. Join us here next week at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars.